Jeremiah rebuked or Jeremiah gave them a warning that they would uh, that God's people would not heed before they went into captivity and his contemporary Isaiah seems to say the opposite don't do on the, on the new way so is this a conflict well let's let's um, let's let's unpack this a little bit there's a lot of trouble that we that we encounter when we're not willing to learn from the past they, there's a saying you guys have probably heard it he who doesn't learn from the past is doomed to what to repeat it if you do not study the past and don't learn uh, lessons from history you will soon learn that there's nothing new under the Sun and you're gonna come across the exact same issues and troubles that we're facing in the past you just don't have any any solutions right um, some of us are, are old enough now to realize that we've tripped over, we've made a lot of the same mistakes that our parents made before us and our unwillingness to, make, to take advice um, led us through that same, you know, had us stepping in those same um, potholes, per se. Um, there's a quote from one of my favorite authors, Ellen White, who says, the enemy studies our he studied, and, I, and I say there's a quote I'm gonna paraphrase it he studies our ancestors he studied past tense our ancestors with fiendish intensity just to know on what points to trip us up meaning he knew that we had the same that that my that my um addictive behavior he saw that in my grandfather and my great-great-grandfather and my great-great-great-great-grandfather and he studied them with fiendish intensity and I'm emphasizing the word fiend because he knew down the road this would create issues for me and for my family he just wasn't gonna bring it up until the best time to, take, to, to tear us down I have to pay attention to what's happened in the past so I can learn before I find myself in the same trouble. You see, when you, um, we're talking about Judah before they go into captivity. But one of the things that had happened in Judah's history was, do you guys remember the first king of, of Jerusalem, of, 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 of Israel? Of Israel when they were united. Saul, right? Now, the people insisted on having a king. So God gave him a king. That was not his design. He wanted to be their king. But then later on, God let the people pick him, and then, well, I mean, God selected him, but the people insisted, so he gave him what they wanted. But then he gave him a man after his own heart, right? Who was that? King what? King David. And then King David showed why we can't put our gaze on any man. Because even a man after God's own heart, who's valiant, who's loyal, who's faithful, who's all of that, can stumble and fall, right? And he stumbled and fall in a bad way. But then... The following king was the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. Did Solomon fall? How did Solomon fall? He fell hard, the same way, somebody just said it, the same way his daddy fell. The same way his daddy fell. That's how Solomon fell, right? So he has a son who would become the next king. Does anybody remember his name? Rehoboam. King Rehoboam. You would think Rehoboam would learn, right? He didn't learn, he added to foolishness. Because this is what happens with Rehoboam. He becomes king. And as soon as he steps in, not only is he not studying the past, he has, he has advisors around him and counselors around him. And then he has like the old school folks that are, you know, that, are, that, that come with all these ideas that used to work with his, with his father and them. And he said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not listening to nothing y'all got to say. I'm doing a new thing. I'm not listening to nothing y'all got to say. He oppressed them. Rehoboam did not only become the next king of Israel, he became the last king of Israel. 
meaning he was the fourth king of Israel and the empire was split. The empire was divided on his watch. Why? Because of an unwillingness to embrace and to learn from the past and to come to the table. There were generational differences for sure. Sometimes we get fixed on this idea that my way is the right way. And every, any way that's not my way, hit the highway. But in reality, there's wisdom to be drawn from the past. But there also needs to be a realization that God is always doing something what? God is, something do, God is always doing something new. See, one of the challenges is that while we should learn from the past, we're not meant to get fixated on the past. We're not meant to be stuck in the past. Let me give you some examples, I'm gonna, and I'm going to do this respectfully. You ever seen somebody with a, man, how do I do this respectfully? You know I love y'all, right? Okay. Because this does not apply to anybody that I know here. This is why I can use this example. I just, the second I say it, it's going to apply to somebody. All right, you ever seen somebody with a jerry curl in, 2000, in 2020? Do you know what a jerry curl is? All right. Or you ever seen, um, have you ever seen somebody with, a, with, with, with like bell bottoms? No, that, that one's a little more far-fetched, right? But, you, but, you, but you've seen it. You've seen it. Oh, when I was a kid, there was this fam the famous hairstyle was the rat tail. I don't know what you know what that is. You cut your hair, you just let one thing grow right here. I've grown up and seen grown men with rat tails from my generation. They didn't know when to let go. It becomes problematic. You stand out for all the wrong reasons sometimes when you get stuck in the past. So you can, you can have your favorite genre of something. You get so stuck in that. And you think that that's the right way. That you don't realize that you, you, you can get stuck in a snapshot of time. Everybody has a right to pick their favorite genre, to have a favorite whatever. And, and I, I'm going to hope to connect this later. In case I forget to connect it, let me use certain words that... that that will um, resonate right now. Every, everybody has a favorite genres. Everybody also, people have their favorite worship styles also. Their, 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 their preferred clothing. Right? All of that. Does that mean that one is inherently and divinely appointed? Not necessarily. People have the, you know, um, musically for example, say genres of music. Pop music. I've never liked pop music. I've never liked pop music at any point in my life. Pop is simply short for popular. It's usually modern. But I've also not liked classical music. I have an appreciation for shit. Brother, <laughs> I'm already stepping on toes. <laughs> I can have an appreciation for, for, for classical music because my daughter wound up learning how to play violin and she played in a strings ensemble and all of a sudden I was like, oh man, okay, I like this. This is very relaxing and I could put it on while I read and it wasn't disruptive. But those are, those are on two opposite extremes of things, right? Is the person who, who likes classical music um, more, more, more intelligent than the person who likes popular music, pop music. Okay, so your bias is showing, right? Y'all tuck it in, tuck it in. Your bias is showing. Because <laughs> classical was most popular in a particular era in time, right? Or how about oldies? You ever listen to the oldie station? Look, um, there's a station called in Atlanta, um, I don't think it still exists, it was called Peach 94.9. We were talking with somebody about this the other day. My mother grew up, uh, well, I, I, we moved from Miami to Atlanta, and when I was a kid, we used to listen a lot to Peach 94.9 because it was just soft, old school music. My mother would put it on. She didn't even speak English. She didn't understand it. It was just a station that I could put on, and, and it's nice background music, but I don't even know or care what they're saying. 
Well, I picked up on all these songs. I didn't know I was picking them up, but every time I walk into a, for some reason, every time I walk into a store or a grocery store, or whatever, whatever is playing that's from the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, I know it. And I don't know why I know it. It's just in the background. You know, I'll just be walking around, and it's like, she's just a small town girl. And I just living in a low, where did that come from? Like, I don't, why do I even know this? I don't know that song. I don't even know, who, I mean, I don't know the artist. But it's just all there. She put it on because it was safe. But there's nothing inherently better about that than every other worship, than every other music style. There's other music styles that might be more vulgar, and I'm not with it. But I realized that even with all these songs, like when I sat there and got to thinking about a lot of the lyrics, I realized, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of funny messages or, 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 or even perverse messages sometimes in a lot of these soft-sounding songs that would rival some of the modern stuff. Like the other day, I, was last, I remember last, uh, last winter, I heard this song, um, Come On, Baby, It's Cold Outside. And I always thought it was like, you know, like, 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 like a, a, a nice, snazzy little jingle. And then I actually thought about the lyrics. I'm like, this brother doesn't know how to take no for an answer. <laughs> That's basically a jingle about a gentleman who will not take no and wants to have a nice time with this lady. Wants, is insistent. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm not trying to ruin the song for you. But I listen to modern songs. I'm like, even some of the raunchy modern songs are not as, as, as creepy as this one. What I'm saying is that we have style preferences and then sometimes we can get hung up on that and we think that this is the right way. When it's not necessarily. Um, it's just a preference. Many times we can live or get stuck in our heyday. You guys know the term heyday? I used to play basketball, I used to be in shape. There's no convincing me that 1996 wasn't the best year in Earth's history. There's no convincing me that, 19, that between 1996 and, and the 2000s, that life was just better than any other era. But it's all subjective. Does this make sense? I want to see if you're following me, because when I, get, when I start connecting dots, when I start connecting dots, I don't want, you know, if, if, you get, if you get mad, you can get mad. But when I start connecting dots, I just want that to make sense. It's all subjective, right? My heyday is not somebody else's heyday. And oftentimes, our heyday, meaning the, the time, uh, the prime time, the, the best eras of our life, oftentimes when we talk about it, it's overstated, right? I'll talk about about how great things were in, 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 in my heyday and, and how great the basketball team of my former high school was in my heyday, and I overstate it. You would think we never lost a game. You know, you would think, you think, you would think everybody on the team could, sl could slam a basketball and could shoot a three-pointer. But in, con like, uh, in hindsight, I'm saying, from where I'm standing now, everything back then seems a lot more glorious than it actually was sometimes. Am I the only one? I mean, y'all leaving me here alone. Am I the only one? Or is there anybody here honest enough to say, yeah? Is there anybody here, you know, honest enough to say, yeah, you know, when I used to puff my hair out uh, and, and, and use a whole can of hairspray, like, it, didn't, it wasn't actually as cool as I, as I remember it. This happens to all of us. We get stuck in the past, and that's why when we go to, um, and, and hold on, before I go back to the text, before I go back to the text, because I want to go back to the, to, to the verse in Isaiah. Actually, let's go to the verse in Isaiah. I'm going to read that one one more time. Um, if we can get that up on the screen, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18. This is why... God said, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He's not saying wipe it from your memory. He's not saying there's nothing to be gained or learned from the past. He's saying don't get fixated on it and, 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 and live in a time capsule. You know, there was a time when, um, as I talk about 
when I, when I mention like heydays and how we overstate it sometimes. Sometimes we, we, we get fixated on the wrong heyday even. And now I'm talking as a church. Let me bring you back to as a church. There's things that we hold on to that we latch on to as a church. This is the right way to do it. This is how you're supposed to do I'm, I'm going to throw some, some examples out there. And you can feel free to, to, to approach me. I got time today. The speaker for the Spanish side, I'm going to take him to lunch. After about 3 o'clock, I got time today. You can show me from the Bible. But sometimes we get fixated on things like, like for example, communion. Let's do, we're going to do an agape feast. Pastor, that's not the right communion. That's not how you do communion. We get fixated on this is the right way to do it. Where did communion start, for example? Jesus, Where? Breaking bread, more specifically, in the upper room, in the Last Supper. Were they taking, sh uh, and, I'll, and I'll say this respectfully to God, but to the traditionalists, we can you can take this however you would like. Were they taking shot glasses of grape juice? No. Were they eating, were they eating chiclet size pieces of bread? No. Okay. If you ask me, the heyday of the communion or the model that we should all try to follow is what? Is the original. But we get fixated on a heyday that came from, from the universal Roman Catholic Church. Nothing against them, but we get fixated on that. Music. Mm. Uh, you're not ready for that one yet. Carpet. Let's go to back. Let's go to carpet. Red carpet's right. What red carpet did they ever roll out for Jesus? Where, I don't even have to ask you where that came from. Go and look it up. Look that up. The liturgy, because I know some people may feel uncomfortable. And this is not, this is not my ax to grind with how we do service. I'm just trying to open our minds to the stuff that we get fixated on in general. We're not incredibly formal in this service. I don't feel like the setting and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and our target audience, people who need to hear the gospel, um, my feel is that we don't need to be terribly formal in that setting. When you look at a terribly formal liturgy, this structured thing, we, refer, we often think it's heavy reverence. But, I, but if you go back and really study the Bible, and study where we get the liturgy that we have adopted from. We did not form that as Seventh-day Adventists. We didn't even get that model from Protestantism. It comes from somebody's heyday, from somebody's perfect snapshot of when the church was pure. But where that model does not come from is the apostolic church. Let me take you there real quick. Go to Acts chapter 2 with me. I want you to see this because this means something to me. Acts chapter 2. If you ask me for a heyday, when the church was at its peak, when it was at its best, I would say you have to go back to Acts chapter 2. Is there anybody here that would disagree with that? That's when it was pure, right? That's when it was pure. That's when God, that's when the Holy Spirit was moving, right? There was, it was undeniable. It was undeniable what God was doing in the midst of persecution among his people. To me, that is, that's the heyday. That's the model. That's what I want to aim for. I want to see if we have red carpets, organs. I'm saying this respectfully now. Red carpets, organs, a set amount of time uh, for the service. If, you had, if, 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 if people had to pray one particular way, had to listen to one particular style of worship uh, music, if they met in a particular style of setting or building, if the carpet had to be a certain color. Acts chapter 2. And we can start right after Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out. These men came out of the building, out of the upper room. They're speaking in languages. There's people from all nationalities there. Everybody's hearing them in their own tongue. 3,000 people are baptized after one sermon. That's where the church jumps 
from 100 people to thousands. That setting, right? But then you have the model of the apostolic church um, given to us in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, okay, you know what? I will start in um, verse 41. It says, then those who continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, uh, sorry, then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Amen? Amen? All right. Baptism is definitely one. But let's see, let's see the other things, the other pillars of a true church in its heyday. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Doctrine is, is derived from the word of God. Amen? Is that a good thing? All right. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. Is prayer a good thing? Do you see it specified how you're supposed to pray? We'll keep reading it, but you, you tell me if you see specified how you have to pray. It's, you know, kneeling, standing, sitting. Because I can take you to examples in the Bible of praying in every one of those, in, in every one of those positions. I can walk you through the Bible and take you to praying, kneeling, standing, laying, sitting. But as we read this, I want you to tell me if the apostolic church is said to do it one way. The breaking of bread is about fellowshipping. It's about fellowshipping and about communion. It's about both. But it's not specifically specific to one or the other. But let's keep reading. Verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Amen? Many wonders and signs. A sign of, those, of that church is God doing incredible things. God doing things that only God can do. I praise God for that line because there's a lot of folks, there's a lot of folks that hit our, um, there's a lot of folks that are doing the things that hit our mental heyday. And sorry, our mental heyday doesn't usually go back 2,000 years. Our mental heyday usually goes back about 1,000 years. The things that we kind of sometimes insist on seeing in the services and insist on us making a part of our Christian practice and discipline, that stuff usually goes back to about 1,000 years. It, that stuff was going on 1,000 years ago when the church was at its most abusive low point. But here, there was, God was doing signs and wonders. He was doing miracles, people were being baptized, people were breaking bread together, people were praying in all sorts of different ways. I praise God for that. I want to be a church, I want to be a part of a church where we see that. Verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. This is always one that makes people uncomfortable because does this talk about communism? No. This is talking about community. This is talking about when somebody becomes your brother and sister, you really look out for them. You don't sit there and look at the person who joined the church suspiciously because they're not just like you. They don't think like you. They're, you know what I mean? Let me not get too close because they might need a helping hand. Now, Jesus tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But you realize this church is not about seeing what it can get from people, how it can raise money off of people. It's, it's seeing how it can relieve people's needs. Verse 46, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, one accord, harmony, unity. Boy, that's not most churches now, right? If you ask people to give you a top five list of a place where they're likely to hear some gossip, you probably have a hair salon, a barber shop, in front of a bodega, and the church will, the church will be somewhere on David Letterman's top, top ten. I'm not saying this church. I pray, I, I pray that this church... Not establish that kind of culture. That was not a part here. Here it says they were in one accord. There was harmony. But then we'll continue verse 46. Uh, so, sorry, did I read that one already? No. So, continu so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food 
with gladness and simplicity of heart. Where did they break food? The fellowship hall? No, we do the fellowship hall because it's convenient, right? Back then, people walked, you could walk to, 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 to your brother's sister's house. You know, people live spread out. Okay, there's practical reasons. But there's nothing more biblical than getting together with your brother and sister. And breaking some bread at each other's houses, having a word of prayer together before you leave. Praising Jesus. You don't have to do that at church. But notice what it also didn't say. When it said that they sat there and broke bread, it didn't say they broke, and I'm saying this respectfully. It didn't say they broke dairy-free, gluten-free, um, sugar-free, egg-free. Like, look, I'm not saying those things are not important. I'm not. What I'm saying is that, man, we, we, we like to bring in all sorts of things that we don't realize become obstacles. People need to hear the gospel. People need to be saved. People need to see signs and wonders. God is still doing signs and wonders on this earth. Why do we get hung up in so many minors when God is doing things that are so major? You understand what I'm saying? Look, man, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we want to work towards healthier lifestyles, but guess what? To me, it's like, okay, how do we cast a net out into community where people will have a strong desire to come in and hear the word of God without getting hung up on, you know what I'm saying? Things of lesser, uh, of lesser importance. Now, as an individual, I should be always striving towards a healthier lifestyle. But the idea that I have to hold a church hostage, it's not biblical. The idea that I hold the church hostage to, idea, to, to particular specifics that, God's, that, that weren't a practice for God's apostolic church, it's crazy. I, I, respectfully. Um, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. People loved them both. They loved each other within the church, but they also loved, people loved them in the community. They had favor with all people, it says. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Would y'all agree with me that this is the model? This is the model? Would you agree that this is a type of church that you could see yourself being a part of? Yes. And they didn't even have buildings back then. As a matter of fact, let me drop something heavy on you. Let me drop something heavy and deep on you. In those days, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, churches, buildings. Where did they say that they, meet, that they met regularly? They met house to house once a week. Daily people met, right? That's the most biblical model. Now, how would we come across, how would we come into temples? Uh, you know, like, like how, would we, how would we inherit church buildings? Let me give you the care. Let me give you. Let me give you. Let me give you the scary fact. And this is not. Depending how you reason, this may mess with you. Um, a couple hundred years later, when the Roman emperor would claim to be converted into Christian, and he would try to Christianize everything pagan in his kingdom, those pagan temples then became Christian churches. Well, they should have never been worshiping them. Well, we still worship in them. Still worship in them. Now, the thing is that God knows, the Bible says that God, and this is in 1 John, it says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Meaning that because there was a statue in there one day doesn't mean that it cannot be repurposed for God. I know we take that mentality and we apply it to all sorts of other stuff. Well, people do this on this day, so we can't worship Jesus on this day because people used to, or people still worship some kind of a pagan entity on this day. So let's not gather to worship Jesus that day. That becomes problematic if you take that reasoning into still walking into church buildings. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Okay, now with that thought, I walk into this church, and this looks nothing like those, 
This looks nothing like the pagan temples that were later, um, that were later taken for, uh, for Christian services. However, there's a lot of people that will feel uncomfortable coming into a space like this to worship. Why? Because it's unusual. It's a bit, it's unusual, it's a bit darker. It's set up for a public assembly in our modern day, contemporary. It doesn't look like the good old days in the heyday. Right? It doesn't look like the heyday when we had stained glass and, and, and high roofs and artwork that in many cases was there since pagan worship was going on in there. This does not feel like church. Well, the place that feels more like church to you very well may be a place that started with that design for pagan worship. And I'm not telling you that one is evil and one is good. I'm telling you that, 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 that your preference tends to be subjective. I'm telling you this for a reason. This is why when it's, that once, so let me see. Yeah, let's get that, uh, if we can please get that um, Isaiah uh, chapter 17 verse back up there. Isaiah 17. I'm mean, sorry, Isaiah 43, verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. In the context of this, what God is saying through Isaiah is, do not get fixated on certain things that keep you from being able to make progress. Sometimes we don't even understand what we're getting fixated on, what we're getting tied to. When we just read the Apostolic Church, you didn't see anything there about particular color carpet. You didn't see anything there about three or five, um, three or five uh, royal looking chairs on the platform. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Because some of us feel like this ain't really church if we don't have those chairs there. You don't read about that in the Bible anywhere. That had its precedence in a church that was actually persecuting Believers that read the Bible. And so does the way that communion was often done. So does the way a lot of the liturgy that we examine in a lot of churches, those have origins in places. And I'm not saying it's bad. You know what? I can enjoy a worship service at any of our surrounding churches. Adventist churches, and you don't even have to, oh man, let me not, I'm going to get in trouble. Don't even have to be an Adventist church to have Jesus. I'm not in the practice of going to church on Sunday, but I just did a worship service on Sunday at my other church two weeks ago. We worshiped Sabbath, and then we did a service on Sunday, and then we did a service on Monday, and then we did a service on Tuesday, and we did a service on Wednesday, and so on. And we proved that you can actually worship God seven days a week. And that does not mean that the Sabbath is not important and it does not stand out. But sometimes we get fixated on the wrong thing. We just read that they gathered to worship God how often in the, in, the, in the apostolic church? Every day. There's some of us that would have been there six days, not seven. Because you get fixated on the wrong thing. You get fixated on the wrong thing. Hear me well. Not saying the Sabbath is not important. It's absolute, it absolutely is. Not saying that. I'm just saying you get so fixated on the wrong thing, the color of the carpet. Why is it not red? The lack of windows. And why are they not stained? The chair is missing on the platform. And why aren't we walking in during the doxology? And why are we listening to music that is not him? So I need to take us to a Bible verse that, that where God talks about singing a new song. God literally talks about singing a new song. And then when he talks about songs, he talks about all, he says spiritual songs, hymns, psalms. There's like four or five different genres of music that God talks about to worship. This is in the Bible. And then he still comes along in the book of Isaiah and says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I do a what? A new thing. And then he still says, and I'm still doing a new thing. 
I've done all this good and I'm still doing a new thing. Now let me give you context and you can go back and you can read um, Isaiah 43 if you like to dig this up yourself. Here goes some context. People were, what do you think was the biggest event that ever happened among God's people prior to Jesus coming? Yes. Yes. God delivering them out of Egypt through the Red Sea, the miracle he did there. It was the biggest thing that ever happened. So they always talked about it and they commemorated it. And they were supposed to. God told them, commemorate this. Don't forget this. Talk about this every, every year. Every year they would commemorate that event. But what would happen with time? What happens with time is that you keep talking about the miracle that God did back when you got converted. And you don't realize he ain't done nothing. <laughs> you haven't had any new experiences. And then that rolls into the next generation. And the next generation... And everybody's talking about something incredible that God did. The incredible things that God did back in the late, in the, in the, in the, in the mid-1800s. Some of y'all be talking about the 18, you know, and I'm not saying y'all. Uh, this is general term for folks in our church and our denomination. Some of us spend so much time talking about what God does in the 1800s. What is God doing in your life today? We wonder why it's so hard to bring somebody to Jesus. Your neighbor ain't worried about what God did in the 1800s. And I love Adventist history. I promise you. I got time today. Come to the house. I live at 184 Amelia. Edit that from the video. Byron, Georgia. Come to the house. Let's have a fun conversation about Adventist history and about church history. Because these are two things that I am passionate about. And yet, my neighbor Larry... And my neighbor Terry, they do not care what, what, they don't care what God did in the 1800s if he's not doing anything today. And when I'm going through, um, when I'm going through the opposite of heaven in my life, they're not watching to see what they're not watching to see what God did in the 1800s or what God did a thousand or two thousand years ago. They're looking to see if God is real enough in 2023 to get me through this. So when I pull up on them and they want to see you broken and sometimes they see me broken. And then there's other times where, where, where I pull up on them and I'm sharing with them a miracle that God did right here two weeks ago. That means something. That means something. I'm not talking to them about the carpet. I'm not talking to them about the, about, about, about the chair set up on the platform. I'm talking about a God that's just as alive and well. In 2023 as he was 2,000 years ago. A God who is still doing things in our current church the way he was doing them in the apostolic church. And when folks walk, and, 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 and when we get hung up on issues, because I don't, because I don't like a few things. I don't like that. And we get hung up on that at the expense of overlooking all that God is doing that is consistent with his word. To me, there's a problem. And I'm not trying to change anybody's preference. Because I love that there's another church down the street that, where you can worship on Sabbath and has chairs on the, on the platform. And I've worshiped there too. I worshiped there, on, I worshiped there on a Sunday once. They're an Adventist church. They were doing an evangelistic campaign. And I went and worshiped there on a Sunday. And it was nice. You're welcome to go. I encourage you. I encourage you. And there's another church down the street somewhere that will only sing one that only sings one style of music. And I pastor another church where we only sing where we for the most part we sing the same one style of music. And we welcome you there. Whatever you gotta do, by all means, get closer to Jesus. That's it. By all means, get closer to Jesus. Be careful though not to be that stumbling block. That finds something that is within biblical parameters. That is elevating P. 
people in their Christian walk that is drawing closer to people where people's lives are being changed and transformed and sit there and say, I got to put a stop to this because it doesn't look like the heyday. And be careful about fixating on the wrong heyday. Because if your heyday goes back a thousand years, if, if, if your heyday, if, if your vision of the church goes back a thousand years, but it doesn't go back two thousand years, we got a problem, Houston. Let me f- focus on a new thing, because I call this the sequel. I should have called it the prequel, because, <laughs> because I focus more on the not, and not, the not focusing on the past. But let's look at verse 19, and, and I'll wrap this thing up. Verse 19 where it says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know, shall you not know it? I will even make a road where? In the wilderness and rivers where? In the desert. Why does he pick that in particular? So let me just give you the context. I told you I was going to give you context and I forgot because I, I, I go off on tangents. The context was they were always fixated on what God had done back in the, uh, back in um, delivering Egypt, and now they were facing their own captivity. Captive to where? Captive to Babylon. And God's telling them, don't even remember, don't even think about, stop talking about what God did back then, <laughs> what I did back then, because you're now facing your own captivity, and you need God to do something fresh in your life, and I need God to do something fresh in my life. I can't hold on to my mother's experience. I can't hold on to my grandmother's experience. I can't even hold on to the experience that I had 15 years ago when I came to the Lord. I saw God do miracles when I came to the Lord. Miracles. Certified miracles. I, 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 got, I, I got witnesses. And I can't even hold on to that to get through today's struggles and battles. I need God to give me something fresh. So I got to be open to God doing something new. Him doing something new always within the the parameters and limits of what's in God's word. I'm not talking about jumping out and doing something crazy. I ain't going to a seance. I'm not not, not tapping in for, 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 for spiritual powers of the unknown. We're not doing that. I'm not giving myself license to, to, to indulge and practice and sin by any stretch of the imagination. God does, the Bible says God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God himself does not change. God himself does not change, but the methods that he employs to reach individuals often does. Go look at the life of Jesus. Did he witness to Nicodemus in the same way that he witnessed to the woman at the well? Yes and no. Not exactly, but yes, Nicodemus came to see him by night. He went to the woman at the well by day. Nicodemus came seeking from him. He went to the woman at the well and started asking her for a favor that blew her away. You're not even supposed to be talking to a Samaritan. He did things that was, in in his day, that would have been inappropriate via the religious community. I thank God that Jesus was not so concerned about the criticism of the religious community that he could not go and be active and alive in, some, in a sinner's life. And everybody that he reached out to, he reached out to them in a different and in a personal way. Every single one. I promise you, go to anybody, every single story. He re- there's something different about the way that he reaches out to the demoniac versus the blind man versus the para, uh, paralytic versus the leper. God does not work in our life as a one size fits all. So I praise God that there's churches that have windows. And I thank God that there's churches that do him only. And I'm I'm glad that there's churches that have a very set and strict liturgy and that that you will never pray without bowing your knees. I praise God that he has churches that hold that tight line. I don't see, I don't see those limits Personally, I don't see those limits in God's ideal church. I see those practices, but not those limits. So I'm glad that there's churches that do it because of this. Because if the way that the church that I pastor um, does worship does not speak to a particular individual, 
I want them to find somewhere where they can have an easy encounter with Jesus. But I happen to know, I happen to know that there's a lot of people that need Jesus outside of these doors that rather sneak in, catch a seat, hear the word of God, and be rarely seen, rarely heard, and rarely judged. And they've never heard Christian music in their life, but they walk in and they want to hear something they also are going to connect with. And they've never prayed in their life, but if the, if the request is, bow your heads, and they look around and everybody's head just drops, I can do that and not feel like somebody's going to run down, put a hand on me and knock me out. I can, I can, I can do that. And if, and, if, and if the church where you, where you grew up or where I grew up, they stood up and told every visitor to stand every time that they visited. Hey, please stand. Tell us where you're from. Tell us your name. Which is social security number, ma'am? If we don't do that, and I know I'm not trying to be kind of I'm just I'm just trying to be funny, right? But if we don't do that, but we don't do it recognizing that we deal with a generation of people that are, that are socially awkward, that are very apprehensive, that don't like giving out information or whatever, and we decide that we're going to do things a little bit different than the next church, as long as we're within biblical parameters, we're okay. Because at the end of the day, there's some things that's important to me. It's important to me that we be praying, that we be a praying church. It's important that we're a church that breaks bread with each other. It's important that we're a church that's there for each other's needs in community. There better never be somebody here who does it, who, who, who falls on hard times. And, and that's, to me, that's different than a lifestyle. But somebody who falls on hard times and can't find somebody. Wherever God has a son, you have a brother. And you have a lot of brothers and you have a lot of sisters in this building right here. And I'm glad that this is a church where individuals are, are, are giving their lives to the Lord through baptism. I'm glad that it's a church where we study God's word, all of it. You may not hear doctrine every day from this pulpit, but you're going to hear Jesus preach every week. We're going to have specific seasons for doctrine. Every Wednesday, we got prophecy and doctrine over there. I'm glad that this is a church where I feel we're well balanced in that. But I'm also glad that we're a church where we're seeing signs and wonders. And not in some, way, in some weird mysticism, cryptic way, in the way that Jesus did it. Because the same Jesus that was doing things back then is the same Jesus who's out here doing things now. And I praise God. But it doesn't stop there. Because God does not just desire to do a new thing among his church. Because the church is not the building. And the church is not a weekend club. The church are God's people. Meaning that God desires to do a new thing in your life. God desires to do a new thing in your life. And in my life. And sometimes... You know, there's a saying, everybody wants change, but nobody wants to change. Are you waiting for God to bring a season of newness into your life? You got to stop remembering the former things of old sometimes. Sometimes you got to stop holding on to and dragging the past with you. You can't have a new experience and remain the same old Jew. That's insanity, right? They say the church is a hospital, right? You know what somebody told me one time? Respectfully. Somebody told me. I told, I told somebody, man, the church is a hospital. He said, yeah, an insane asylum is a hospital too. And I said, man, that sounded messed up. But I thought about it, the more I thought about it, I said, you're right. You know why? It is a type of hospital. And, you know, we talk about the definition of insanity is what? To do the same thing and expect different results. You can't keep doing the same thing and tell God, God, do a new thing while I do the same thing. God, do a new thing while I do the same thing. Getting into the water and being baptized does not change and transform your life. A relationship with Jesus changes and transforms your life. And we express that through the baptistry. But a relationship with Jesus has to be fed and fueled every day. Right? 
Something's got to change in your life. Going to a church that's seeing signs and wonders will not change your life, will not bring a new thing to your life. An experience with Jesus will bring a new thing to your life. Letting go of your ego, letting go of your, of your, of, uh, 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 of your covetousness, of your envy, of your bad attitude, the things that, 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 that squeeze Jesus out of your life, that will bring a new thing into your life. Coming to a church, man, God's been doing miracles in this church. But he's not doing miracles in everybody's life in this church. Because for some of us, the biggest change in our life has simply been coming across the street. But what has to change in our lives has to happen the other six days of the week. So when you come in here, you add, you say, let me tell you all what God did this week. And that's going to be a result of what happened every other day of the week. God wants to do a new thing, but we got to be willing to stop living in a time capsule, stop being the same people, stop living in a snapshot of the past. Because God has something new he wants to do today and forever, every day. God, has, God will complete the good work that he has started in you. Complete it, meaning he's constantly working. If you've arrived, and I'm sorry, and, and I'm sorry that I've gone long. That's that's not a new thing. <laughs> that's not a new thing. That's an old thing. I'm trying to let go. I'm trying to forget. I'm trying to forget the past and step into a new thing. He said, I'm, I'm a work in progress, and we are. But that's that's the point. Because if some of us get uneasy when we start when it, when we start getting challenged, right? We get uneasy. That's great evidence. That's great evidence that I'm fixated to a snapshot and that God needs a little bit of room to work and to bring something new this season. I'm not telling you to compromise. I would never ask anybody to compromise on God's word. And if you think I'm compromising on God's word in anything, please challenge me. Please challenge me. I got time. But I want to see the Spirit of God moving in a powerful way in my life. And I realize that there's things that I'm fixed to that I need to let go of. Most of it is, is, is intangible character stuff. Some of it is just day-to-day -day decisions. And in regards to God's church, he's doing a new thing. And I say respectfully. If it's not in line with God's word, challenge it with God's word. But if it is, and it's just not your preference, there's many, there's, there's many places where, 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 where our souls can be fed. And this is just one of many. I pray that you guys have a, a great week. I want to ask our music team to come up and close us out in, in song. Because the most important, um, who is it that brings about change? We know it's God, but let's be more specific. Are you going to will yourself? into change or transformation into a new season or or how does god do it what he's gonna what he's gonna use the holy spirit that's the most important thing that's that's the one consistent that's what was present at the start of the apostolic church and we're told that that was the early reign the holy spirit being poured out in the early church we're told that was the early reign we're told god is going to do much more magnificent things at the close of history than he did at the start of the church. But the one constant is that we need that Holy Spirit. Do you guys agree? If you're in agreement, I'm gonna invite you to stand as we, as we close out singing Sweet, Sweet Spirit. of the Lord of the Lord there are sweet expressions there are sweet expressions on each face and I know they feel the presence of the Lord and I know they feel the presence of the Lord sweet holy
Holy Spirit. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us. Stay. As April continues to play, I'm going to invite you, uh, those who are willing and able, I'm going to invite you to kneel. If you can't kneel, you can, uh, you can sit. But I'm going to invite you to kneel as we close this service out in prayer. We don't end every service the same. We don't do every service the same. And that's all right because God ought to have a little bit of flexibility and liberty to do things different. This is what this message is about. The message today is about giving God room to work and do something different. Right? So we're gonna, we're, 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 we can make that a practice here. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm grateful, Lord, because you're patient with us, even through our nonsense. I thank you, Lord, because you have done powerful things in our lives. In the past, you have done powerful things um, in our history as a movement. You have done powerful things all throughout history, Lord, for the purpose of bringing salvation and bringing hope into the lives of your children things are no different today just because it's 2023 it doesn't mean that you're not working anymore it means that you want to work greater than ever because your coming is near therefore Lord open our eyes open our hearts help us to see um, to choose carefully the hills that we die on help us to let, select carefully the places where we plant our flags Lord Help us to be sensitive to, um, in the study of your word, to understand what are your principles versus what is our preference. But also, Lord, help us to be sensitive, even more sensitive to the moving of your spirit. So if there is anything that is lodged in our hearts that needs to be moved for you to bring in a new season and for you to do a new thing, I ask, Lord, that you would do it. I ask, Lord, that your spirit would work heavy in our hearts, Lord. That you would revive us. That you would do signs and wonders in our lives as individuals. That prayer and the breaking of bread and the living in community and the living in harmony with each other would be a reality in our lives as individuals and, and, and in our lives collectively as a church. Because we are the church. And for anybody here who's joining us today for the first time, I pray that it not be the last time. I pray, Lord, that you would move in their lives in a powerful way and that they could come back here that we may celebrate their victories too. Bless us here in person. Bless those who are online and bless those who couldn't be with us at all. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. You have a great week. For those who would like a special season of prayer, our prayer team is going to meet right over here by this cross. God bless you guys. Sweet.